morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's Borland District Council Planning Committee meeting, both for those who are present in the room and those who are watching online. My name is Eleanor, Councillor Eleanor Laming, and I will be chairing the meeting today. On the top table today, we have Tim Barker, Principal Planning Officer. We have Ben Burgess, the Assistant Director of Planning. And we have Leah Arthurton, Democratic Services Officer. Other planning officers will come up to introduce planning applications as they come up on the agenda. We are not expecting a fire drill today, but if the alarm does sound, please leave via the fire exits marked clearly in green and assemble in the car park outside. This meeting is being live streamed, recorded, and will be available later to view online. Members of the public are welcome to film proceedings as long as they are not disruptive to the conduct of the meeting. If anyone wishes to film or record this meeting, please identify yourselves now. Please, can you ensure that your mobile phones and electronic devices are turned to silent? Councillors, please do not use your mobile phone while the committee is in session. We will have comfort breaks at various times throughout the meeting. If you must use your mobile, then please leave the room. However, you will appreciate that this could result in you not being able to vote on the matter under discussion at the time you leave the room. The order of business is set out on the agenda, which is also published on our website. All members will have received in advance a copy of the agenda, presentations and any updates. Members of the public can only speak if prior arrangements have been made in accordance with the Council's scheme of public speaking. The time allocated is a maximum of five minutes per speaker. There is a maximum of 15 minutes allowed per category, so if there are a number of speakers, you can arrange how to allot the time between you. But only people who have registered to speak will be able to address the committee. The order will be as follows. The planning officer will present the application. Then public speakers will be asked to present their case, followed by questions from members of the committee to clarify something the speaker has said and not to invite the speaker to put further points across. When it is your time to speak, you will be invited to come and sit in the public speaking area, which is just there at the front row. The order of public speaking is parish or town council first, followed by objectors, then supporters, for example, the applicant or the agent. Council members who are not members of this committee will then be invited to speak for the allocated time of a maximum of five minutes for each speaker. And this will be followed by questions from members of the committee. Again, these questions will be to only clarify something the speaker has said and not to invite the speaker to put further points across. Then the committee will discuss and determine the application. Finally, there is no provision for members of the public to circulate documents or photographs, for example, at this meeting. Does anyone have any questions before I open the meeting? Thank you. So we now come to item one on the agenda, which is declarations of interest, to receive declarations of interest from members. I, first of all, do need to declare an interest in the first item, which is application 2023-1073, because I'm the ward councillor covering the area and I have made comments on the application. I will not be voting and will withdraw from the room when the application is discussed. Do we have any other declarations of interest? Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to say in terms of item number five, uh, the Sproston, Elizabeth Close. I'm a Sproston Town Councillor. Uh, it was discussed in the meeting, but I didn't take part in the debate. 
yes, councillor. Same, t- same myself as um, councillor Vincent. I was also in that same meeting and I didn't vote or discuss it. Thank you, councillor Baby. So you will be able to discuss the application of vote. Thank you. Do we have any other declarations of interest? No? Thank you. So we move to item two on the agenda. Apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair. We have apologies and absence from Councillor Karimi Guven Lou, Councillor Hempsell, and Councillor Leggett with Councillor Weimar for point of substitute. Thank you. Um, Councillor Karimi Guvan Lu is the chairman of the planning committee and unfortunately is unwell. And I'm sure you'd like to join with me in wishing her well on behalf of the committee and hope that she feels better soon. Um, and I'd also like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the committee to our new assistant director of planning, Ben Burgess, who is here today. We now come to item number three on the agenda to confirm the minutes from the meeting of the previous planning committee, which was held on the 28th of February this year and consider any matters arising. Do we have any matters arising from those minutes? No, thank you. So we can approve those minutes. And now we come to planning applications on the agenda. So item one, as I've explained, I have an interest in this meeting, so I will now be leaving the room while the application is discussed. So in the absence of the the chairwoman, um, we will need to seek a nomination for a temporary chair just for application one. Um, Do we have any nominations amongst the members? Present still. Oh. Yeah, is there a seconder for Councillor Weimar? Just to... yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, are there any other nominations? Just to double check. No, brilliant. So that's Councillor Weimar in chair for, t- for the item one. Well, thank you for everybody. Um, so while uh, the chair is absent, I shall substitute. So this is the order we will follow. Um, the planning officer will present the application and then public speakers will then be asked to present their case, followed by the questions from members of the committee to clarify something the speaker said and not to invite the speaker to put further points across. The order of public speaking is, uh, as previously stated, but parish, town council first, followed by objectors, and finally supporters, e.g. the applicant or agent. Council members who are not members of this committee will then be invited to speak. I don't, I guess we do have some here, um, uh, but they'll be invited to speak for the allocated time, a maximum of five minutes for each speaker. This will be followed by questions from members of the committee And again, these questions will only be to clarify something the speaker has said and not to invite the speaker to to, uh, put further points across. Uh, The committee will then discuss and determine the application. Okay, so that's all clear. So thank you very much. So if we start with the planning officer and uh, then we move from there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So this site is in uh, the Broadland Gate development just east of here. Um, As you'll be aware, the development of Broadland Gate is well underway with a number of different uses having gone in. These include, amongst others, uh, Lidl and McDonald's up here, 
you may recall this site here, which in yellow, which is um, recently had approval for a Greg's Bakery within drive through. And then close to the site in question, we've got the Grids Turf and uh, the Jaguar Land Rover car dealership, which has gone in here, which are both very much visible from the A47 deposit interchange. And you've also got the Broadland Police Station here. I'll take you through some photos. So this is approaching along uh, Maple Way um, from the west with the, the car dealership uh, on the right, Broadland Police Station on the left. And then you come to the site, which is here, it's associated with the car dealership. It was originally to be used for the storage of new cars for the dealership, but changes in the way Jaguar Land Rover operate their dealerships means they no longer need to get this land for the storage of new cars. And so looking back to the car dealership with the site on the left here. And then again, further up Maple Way, you can see the trees to the rear of the site and then the sort of street lights here on the Potsdam Interchange. Uh, this looks into the site um, from the, the access point. And then you can see from uh, GridServe itself the site here, where it's proposed to construct two drive through restaurants. Uh, this is how it's going to be laid out. So you've got Maple Way along the north, the, the access in to the site, which also serves the rear of the car uh, dealership. And it's proposed that there'll be a Starbucks unit to the front, the site on view from Maple Way, and then the Burger King to the rear. Um, these are the elevations of the stores, which are commercial nature you'd expect from this form of development. And then we also have uh, some visualizations of how it would work on site. So we've got Maple Way coming here, the Starbucks and Burger King grid served there, and then the trees to the rear of the site. Again, with a grid serve here in Maple Way, and you can see the, the junction at the, at the interchange at the back. And then again here. And then that looks, um, and then that's just showing it within the site. You'll note from the report that amendments have been made to the satisfaction of the highway authority in terms of the layout of the, the, the site, uh, in terms of the impact on residential properties, which is to the, the north of the site, for the reasons set out in the report, including the separation distance, and the presence of intervening buildings, it is considered that the impact of the development is acceptable. Now, in regards to drainage, it's now been established that the site can use the drainage infrastructure as originally intended for for the site as a whole, and therefore the lead local authority, flood authority have no objection. It's therefore considered that the proposed development can be accommodated on the site. Whilst it technically may not fall within the uh, uses originally set out for the site <coughs> purely because of the drive through element, food and drink premises were envisaged as part of the overall mix, and clearly have they been they've been accepted in other parts of the site. And as such, it's considered an appropriate use uh, uh, given the surrounding context and is recommended for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Do any mes <laughs> members have any questions of fact of the planning officer? Not for discussion, just fact. No? Okay, lovely. Thank you. Right, so we, we do have a, uh, a speaker here, uh, Darren Burney. Darren Burney, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Darren, you, you'll have five minutes. If you push the, the right-hand button on there, that's it, then you're live. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the Planning Committee and Chair. I'm Darren Burney of Burney Estates Group and the applicants of this application. We're a company with an excellent track record of delivery for schemes, which we are, uh, which we, where we achieve planning approval. We are not strangers to the area, having previously developed the co-op stores and Starbucks in Chartwell Road, and we also own other commercial properties in Mile Cross Lane and Hyme Street in, in Norwich. We retain all schemes we develop, thereby ensuring a good quality build and proper upkeep and maintenance going forward, as well as investing for the long term. Uh, we take pride in every development that we undertake. Despite the current economic climate in the UK, we're fully committed to deliver this scheme, if you're minded to grant planning, um, to achieve an opening date of the stores by autumn 24. During the planning process, we've fully engaged with your planning officer and made amendments where necessary um, and now hope that um, our scheme addresses any concerns. I note that there's no speakers today objecting to the application, but apart from introducing myself to the members of the committee, 
and address any questions you may have. I would like to touch upon some of the comments raised by the local parish council and councillor Laming as set out in page 14 of the report to the committee. Reference was made to the impact of extra traffic generation. However, your highways officer expressed no concerns regarding this. There was a comment made about the proposed restaurant taking away business from the Norwich City Centre. We again provided a sequential test uh, report within our application, which confirmed this would not be the case. Our stores will service a customer basis, um, base that would not normally drive into the centre of Norwich, but more a convenience to those driving past or living or working in proximity to both the Broadland Gate and Broadland Business Park. I would also add that a better choice of supporting food and beverage usually enhances the appeal for companies and staff looking to locate in the area. What we propose is fully sustainable development with a biodiversity net gain. Our development will also create around 45 new full and part-time jobs for people living in the local community, which I trust is a key consideration for you all. Thank you for listening to me this morning, and I hope you'll be able to support the application and respectfully ask that you approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, very good. Thank you. Far less than five minutes. Excellent. Um, are there any questions of fact of, of uh, Darren? No, before we move to discussion. No? Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, Darren. Thank you. All right. So over to the committee. Is there any <coughs> discussion you wish to have between yourselves or with the plan officer? Yes. Councillor Orb. Thank you, Chair. Um, I notice in the planning application it talks about the number of parking spaces. Um, there doesn't seem to be a huge number of parking spaces in this uh, application. Um, is this, you know, what, what calculations have gone on to, um, um, to define, you know, if that's enough, if, that, if that's uh, enough spaces for both of those restaurants? Because, you know, they're quite busy places, drive throughs so the, that's the um, parking standards which Norfolk County Council have, and they were being assessed against them by the uh, highway officer, and they then are satisfied that that's the appropriate level of parking for those that use glass um, that's provided. So there's, you know, the highway authority are happy with that, and we don't have any reason to go against that. Thank you. No. No more discussion. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Thank you, yeah. Well, if we have to move to the vote, the recommendation is for approval with conditions. It's on page 19 in detail. I can read it all out if you wish. I will for the people, the public here. Approval with uh, conditions and subject to the satisfactory completion of a Section 106 agreement that secures a financial contribution towards sustainable transport. One, there's a time limit uh, for full permission. Uh, two, in accordance with submitted details. Three, biodiversity enhancements, as has been touched upon. Uh, four, provision of parking there, which obviously we've got clarified. Five, unknown termination. Six, details of uh, cooking fume extraction system. Seven, surface water drainage. Eight, ecological enhancements. And nine, external lighting. So I'm happy to propose that. If anyone would like to second it, Councillor Baby. And uh, can we now vote? Oh, all in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Councillor Wymark. I'll bring um, Councillor Lehman back in.
Hello. Um, thank you for your patience with, with, with that application and for me leaving the room. Um, we now come to application number two on the agenda. That is planning reference number 20221817, Hillcrest Nurseries, South Burlingham Road. And I'd like to invite senior so, uh, area team manager, Claire Curtis, to introduce this application. Thank you, Chairman. The application you have in front of you is the um, demolition of an existing building and the erection of a two-storey dwelling and garage as, as set out as Hillcrest Nurseries, South Burlingham Road at Lingwood. The proposal brings up some key considerations that I just want to, to outline to you before I go through the presentation. So the, the site is outside the development boundary and therefore is technically contrary to policy unless there's, there's material considerations otherwise. The site benefits from a Class Q prior approval for conversion to dwelling and this application seeks to remove that building that has permission for conversion to a dwelling and erect what I would term as a replacement dwelling on the site. So that's your key consideration. Also, in terms of material, principle of the development. Also, of course, we could consider the design and impact of the proposal on the character and appearance of the area and the technical implications uh, impact on residential amenities, highways, trees, flooding, drainage, and ecology. So if I turn to uh, slide, um, the first slide, this is the site location plan. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex of buildings at the moment, the nursery, and it has outbuildings within it. This um, building here is this site of the Class Q, the way building that's got permission for that prior approval. And this the red line denotes your application site. So I thought it'd be, it'd be helpful if we gave you a satellite image of the site in relation to the, to the village of Lingwood, so you can see it in context, and that it's, it is outside the main part of the village. And I think this slide is helpful in terms of, again, giving you an, a flavor of the site. You see the existing buildings. This is your Class Q building, and this is your application site which obviously has, as you can see, mature planting around it, which we'll come to in further considerations. So um, one, of the, one of the issues, that, or one of the points I want to make is that this is very well screened, the site, and just, that's why I want you to see this, this image so you can have a flavour for that, you can appreciate the um, existing vegetation, because it's key to considerations. So this is your application site. It's been, the dwelling has been moved um, into what I would call a slightly more central location than the consent of Class Q. But you will note that the garage is sited on top of the Class Q, which is, again, is an important part of our deliberations. The des design of the dwelling itself has been slightly mended. Not, not a lot, but slightly. It is two-storey. It's a contemporary feel. Um, the materials, um, it's a dark roof, slate roof colour, and we also have uh, originally had white render, which having conversations with your senior heritage and design officer, we felt it would benefit from having slightly more muted colour scheme, which the um, agent and applicant have been happy to do. They have suggested, we're going to de deal with the exact details of materials later, but they have agreed to a more muted uh, colour palette. The, the, the central section was flat roof. They've now put a, a, a pitch roof on it, which we felt um, improved the design. So overall, <laughs> we have no objection to the design. We feel that it's appropriate to its uh, location, siting within the site, and it is a high quality design, uh, which as I say, responds well to its context. And the garage, which I'll come on to in a moment, follows the same design as the main dwelling. Now, that originally was a two-storey garage, but through negotiations, it's been reduced to a single storey. The key, again, is that its location is on top of that queue. So this is the, um, 
outbuilding that has consent and prior approval. And I think we aren't just looking at the replacement in line of what's there at the moment. We need to look at what it has consent to be converted to, because that's your bar, that's your baseline. So this plan here shows you the, I just wanted to touch on this, this shows you the queue location, but it also shows you the extent of the red line. A queue is very, very restrictive. If you apply for that, you can only have a red line immediately around the building. It doesn't give you a lot of space for curtilage or for parking. It's very restrictive, and that's legislation. So just bear in mind that what nine times out of ten, what we'll have is once we've, they've got a class Q consent through the legislation, they will then apply for an extended curtilage for a garden to put modest outbuildings up perhaps put renewable energy on the building. So I think we just need to remember that, again, when we're considering the new two-storey dwelling and garage. So this is design. It kept, again, because of legislation, it kept the um, metal profiling. All that was added to this was windows and doors. I'll give you a context of the site. So this is your access into the site. You can see the mature planting that we have. The views from the South Burlingham Road are very limited. This is a proposed location as you're moving into the site of the dwelling. Um, this will involve uh, the removal of some trees and vegetation to actually create the site, but that has been mitigated by, the, uh, by a, a proposed planting scheme and tree protection for those that will remain. And both your um, specialists in terms of trees and ecology are happy subject to the various conditions that you have on, imposed on the agenda. Again, this is a, you can see some of the trees that need to be removed and the location of the dwelling within the site. And that's looking over towards the adjacent neighboring property. And this is a photograph on the on the main on the main road of the, of the um, looking as I say west and south. So, if we now turn to the considerations in front of us in terms of the application, so you have, as I've said, you have an existing class Q prior approval. Principle of development in this location is outside a development boundary, so there's got to be a reason why we would wish to promote a, a new dwelling in this in this setting. Parish Council, you can see from the agenda and from the supplementary uh, note, have, have concerns in terms of the uh, addition of a dwelling in this location. However, key to this consideration, as I say, is that class Q, which hasn't been converted, nor have works commenced on it, but through law, and I quoted that within the um, agenda for in the report for you to understand, that is considered a lawful class Q fallback as a residential property. So you're effectively losing one, gaining another one. So there's not an, there's not an additional dwelling above and beyond that. The baseline for our assessment in, in the exist, is the existing appearance of the character of the site. The design of a class queue, as I've said, was very constrained by its limitations in legislation and the curtilage also was small. The proposed dwelling will have a similar floor area to that permitted. Class queue is 255 square metres, where your proposed two-storey dwelling is 272.5 square metres. That's an increase of 17.5, which in my mind is quite a reasonable increase in that in that relation the garage however does add that 6.9 square meters onto the overall which just takes it over however on balance it's considered that we would get further applications in that queue probably for outbuildings it's in a it's in a it's in a a good location it's going on top of the queue, of the class Q building it's got good screening around it so on balance it's considered that that is acceptable as an as an increase 
In terms of the impacts on residential amenities, highway safety, flooding and drainage, there's been no objections raised and, and these have been subject to conditions reflected in the agenda. As I pointed out, there will be some removal of trees, however there's proposed new planting and protection of the trees that will remain. And that still retains those ones that create the mitigation and screening from the, um, from the highway. So it's a sum up, it's outside development boundary. Your class queue represents a, a legal fallback position and allows for that additional replacement dwelling. The design of the siting of the new dwelling is considered appropriate and have no more impact than that consented queue should it be converted. And in light of that chair, I would wish to recommend approval with the conditions set out in the agenda. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do councillors have any questions for the planning officer? Councillor Orber. Thank you, Chair. Um, what are we doing about permitted development rights on this site? Can we restrict them? Yes, we have. We have proposed conditions in that respect on the agenda. So, if I yes, so if you. Sorry to interrupt. If you look at page 32, you'll see the conditions are in okay. there. And we have condition 15 and condition 16 that oh, look to PD. Have been PD. We've got 19 as well. So that's your fences, walls, that's extensions, the roof conversions, um, solar arrays. So it's quite a lot of permitted development rights we're taking away. Councillor Me again, sorry. Um, what about the, the, the existing road that goes past the house? It, what, what is at the end of it? And is there much traffic go up, going up there at the moment? So along that track, there is one other dwelling. So if you're coming, uh, if you face the houses on the left-hand side, there is one further dwelling along there. There is another dwelling just on the left-hand side, which the applicants did once own, which has been recently sold. So there would be three total dwellings using that kind of off of man, um, made track. I, I think, does the planning application include doing anything with that track at all, or is that just going to stay as it is? Stay as it is. Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just clarification, please, on condition 14 about the use of the garage. Are we saying there the condition is that it's only ancillary to the main property or the domestic building and it couldn't be converted into another property? So condition 14 would be to make sure it's in, used in association with the main house. So it then it cannot be let out, sold, used commercially, etc. So it has to be used as a kind of domesticated garage. Okay, and there'd be no, is there any possibility that that could be converted into a property or, or are you saying from what those conditions, no, it couldn't? So that would need planning permission in any instance. So we'd have to assess that at another application if that was to come forward, that wouldn't have a right to go forward as under prior notification. Thank you. What you could also do if you were, if you were concerned that that could be used for anything other than a garage and storage we can also take permitted development rights away in respect of that so that it needs permission to change that to anything other than a garage and storage do we have any other questions for the officer councillor orber okay final question about the construction works have we got? Have you considered putting anything like a construction plan in um, for the works? You know, for the noise and the dust and those sort of things. Is there anything we can do in that respect? We wouldn't normally put a construction management plan in for a single dwelling, in that sense, because and also given the location of the nearest neighbours, there is a distance between those properties so as I say it's not something that I would normally put on a domestic uh, a direction of one dwelling if we were talking about a larger group of dwellings where you've got a higher number of vehicle um, traffic then that would be something we would potentially consider 
we're not in this and we haven't proposed this. Any further questions for the officer? No, thank you. So we will now move to public speaking. Um, I have the agent registered to speak on my list, Mr. James Sizer, would you like to speak? Thank you. You have five minutes from when you start and we'll give you one minute, we'll give you notice when you've got one minute left to go. Not a problem, thank you. Um, so, well, thank you very much to the planning officer in this case, who's done a lot of the job for me. <laughs> um, a lot of the points I had written down here have been well addressed by the, uh, by the, 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 the accurate and uh, fair um, explanation of Class Q. Um, I'd like to say this morning, it's nice to see a few familiar faces on the committee. And remember, several of you coming to uh, visit us at another project we and also met your community at Heart Awards where we won the Broadland Design Award a couple of years ago. Um, the fact is that this project is not so dissimilar as to, the, as to that application to demolish an inefficient old structure and replace it with a modern energy efficient dwelling in a sensitive manner whilst respecting the site and enhancing the surroundings. Unfortunately, there seems to have been a bit of a factual misconception which is perpetuated through the various revisions to the scheme mainly brought up by the Parish Council feedback. Um, this is a proposal for, that, that their perception is that this is a proposal for a new dwelling in the open countryside without any foundation in terms of planning policy. Um, as I said, uh, the senior officer um, and area manager has outlined the reasons why that's factually inaccurate. The, pros, the proposal is in fact predicated on replacing a potentially inefficient dwelling with a better one. This comes out by the earlier approval of the barn conversion under Class Q. Our client, importantly, does have the option to, to, uh, to convert that, that, that uh, barn into a dwelling. And so, effectively, what's happened is that the change of use has already occurred. So, we could view it as the fact that, although it hasn't been executed, that the change of the use of the ground under it, under Class QA, has already occurred. If we consider the wording of Class Q itself, um, Class Q, Permitted development order states uh, development consisting of a a change of use of the building or land within its curtilage for use as an agricultural building to a use falling within C3 dwelling houses of the schedule to the use classes order. So that in that respect basically states that that's what's happening. We're changing the use of an agricultural building to a domestic one. Part B is where um, this becomes complicated and why this type of application is desirable for both the applicant and one could argue the wider public. Class QB states that building operations reasonably necessary to convert the building referred to in paragraph A using within class C dwelling houses of that schedule. What that part does and what the legislation goes on to say is that the changes that can be made to that, that existing building are so limited as to just basically insert windows into existing openings in the structure and, and undertake such limited building uh, application uh, operations as would be reasonably necessary to make it a basic house. So, although the granting of Class Q effectively changed the use of the barn and its curtains to residential, and, and as your delegated plan officer has confirmed, um, that this is a matter of fact and can be judged as a fallback position as set out in her report. This is result, arises as a result of the restrictive nature of Class QB, which we actually, <laughs> we actually fully support. Class QB limits the approach that can be taken with design and construction. For obvious reasons, should the permit development of barns be unrestricted, it would afford the developer free reign on design and result in uncontrolled development. Effectively, considering the development as a fallback planning application preserves the ability by the planner to before the planning department and the committee in this case to consider the proposals under the normal rules. Other factors such as the design, sustainability, material considerations of any scheme which seeks to deviate from the strict intent of Class QB can be properly controlled. I personally think this is a system which perhaps by accident works actually rather well and for all the right, right reasons. The project is, this project is a case in point. It would be entirely possible thank you, uh, to convert the barn under the previous approval and there's a real possibility of doing so. However, it would result in so much worse a dwelling. 
it would be bound to be less attractive, less efficient, less practical, higher maintenance, and more expensive to execute. For all of those reasons, and as I said, based on the previous uh, self-build schemes we've executed in, executed in the in the district, I would respectfully ask that members move to approve the scheme in accordance with the recommendations of the delegate officer. And thank you. Thank you very much for coming to speak at the meeting. Do councillors have any questions for our speaker? Yeah, councillor Wymark. Thank you. It was just a question, obviously following on from what Councillor Vincent asked. But, I mean, would, would you would you appeal any change to the conditions uh, around the use of the garage to to reduce any permitted development? There isn't an intention to do so at this, point, at this moment in time. I haven't discussed the matter directly with the applicant, but. Their, their initial view was that they would probably have it as a two-storey uh, situation, not to be let to the public, but more as, as like a visiting family type setup. Um, that's what information I have to hand. I've no reason to doubt anything they've said. They're incredibly nice people, which I also had in my list here of things to say, but I'm not allowed to make an additional point. Um, I, don't, I don't believe there's any nefarious intent to what they're doing here at all. Do we have any more questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of the public speaking session. So we now hand over to the committee for comments, discussion and voting. What, does anyone have any comments? Councillor Vincent. Thank you. Um, I guess the one comment I'd like to make is a lot of the discussion has been predicated on the fact that it's a uh, class Q dwelling, well, uh, development's been approved, and that's going to be replaced with a dwelling elsewhere. And a lot of the mitigation throughout the report is in respect of there isn't any additional traffic because it's one dwelling and all of those sorts of things. So I'd be happy to approve or move for approval, but with that condition of removing permitted development on the garage. Um, as we've just heard, there's no intention at the moment, but that's not to say there might not be in the future, and it's going to be a two-storey building for visiting family. For me, that's a slight concern. It's not proposed to be two-storey. It's single-storey at the moment. They did originally propose a two-storey, and we asked them to reduce the size of it so that we, because as I explained in the presentation, we got into that comparative point about the size of the queue in relation to the dwelling and the garage. So they, they, re, they reduce the size. So the proposed garage is, is that. So it's not, it's, it's got Velux windows on the top, but originally it was that uh, physically had the rooms above. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to do what you request. Thank you. So we've had a proposal that we approve this application with the addition of removal of permitted development rights from the garage. Do we have a seconder for that proposal? Councillor Wymark seconds the proposal. Do we have any further comments or discussion to make? No, no. Further comments? So um, we have the proposal on the table. If you're in favour of that proposal, please raise your hand. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much. That application's approved. We now move on to item three on our agenda, planning reference number 2023-3861-F. This planning application is in Acle, land north of Damgate Lane, and in the papers it begins at page 33 on the agenda. I'd like to invite planning officers to 
present this application. Just, just to clarify, we have two planning officers at top table, area team manager Claire Curtis and senior planning officer Ellie Yarum. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This application in front of you is um, the erection of three dwellings, which is a change from self-build to market housing at land north of Damgate Lane at April. So the main, re the main issues here is that change from self-build to uh, market housing. Um, you can see from the agenda, we attached a previous committee report where members gave consent for four dwellings in this location that was outside the development boundary um, and was given in response to the fact that we did not have a five-year land supply of dwellings and April was considered a sustainable, appropriate location and the identified harm, which was balanced against the provision of housing in this particular instance, was a landscape harm. So I'll go through the um, slides for you. So this is the application site. Now, I think if we need to bear in mind, if we've given consent for four dwellings, one of which has already been commenced, all the designs of all dwellings have been agreed under reserve matters and all pre-commencement conditions have been complied with and discharged with the council. So you have a lawful consent, extant consent on the site for four dwellings. So this is your site location plan, as I say. We, we have shown you um, the location of the site in relation to April. These, as you can see, works have started on the site, as the, as the imagery shows, which is, relative, which is uh, quite up to date for, for Google. Um, and then again, as I say, the, the three plots in question today are one, two, and three, shown on there in with, um, around in red and green and grey and orange. This is a flavour for the consented designs. These have not changed. Uh, we've already given permission for these. But to give you a flavour for what we grant consent for under the reserve matters. And this is the site, the entrance or further into the site. You can see that's commenced, the garage is, is up. And the number, this is plot number four. And this is your street scene, just to, again, to give you flavor looking at either way. And back out from the site to the road. So, four self-build properties were granted consent in November 2022 under an outline planning commission. And as I've just said, subsequently all reserve matters have been approved and all pre-commencement conditions submitted and agreed. This application site, sorry, this application proposed to change three dwellings from self-build to market, and that's your consideration today. So whilst the application is supported by lots of documentation, including housing designs and um, the citing massing and scale and landscaping access and drainage, these have already been approved, but they are required to be supported in this instance because it is a full planning application. The main consideration for us today is that change. The original, as I say, the original outcome consent was granted in light of the council not being able to demonstrate a five-year land supply of dwellings, deliverable sites. It's important to note that this doesn't def differentiate between the types of tenure. This is all housing that we, ha we didn't have. That application, outlined consent, was, grand was assessed by seeking the benefits of the scheme and harm in context of that sustainable development argument in the set out in the MPPF. When we discussed it previously, it was con con concluded that the benefit of providing that additional housing 
did not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the negative landscape harm that we had identified through that assessment. There, as I said, this change reflects is relates to plots one to three. Plot four still stays as self-build and has commenced. The self-build was promoted by the agent and applicant, and while it just yes, it weighed in weight in favour of the proposal. That was only provided that the, the a UU, a unilateral agreement was, uh, was signed because then that secured the self-build. When we were determining the application, I do not consider that the self-build was a determining factor for us to recommend approval to, to the members at that time. We didn't have a land supply, it doesn't differentiate. In terms of the self-build register where people can apply to be on the self-build, um, custom build, there was sufficient plots to, to uh, accommodate that number at that time, and there is still <coughs> sufficient plots to accommodate that number as we stand today without these three plots. So again, that's a material consideration for us to, to, to take, bear in mind. So to conclude, the outline planning commission was granted consent because of that lack of housing supply. The self-build was not a determining factor for the council in our recommendation and the harm that was identified, which was a landscape harm, given the fact that it was considered otherwise a sustainable, appropriate location, it will be created with or without it being self-build or market. They are going, it's physically being built. So that, create, that harm is already created and occurring. And as I said, that harm was outweighed by the benefit of providing that housing. So I would recommend approval to you, Chair, um, subject to the conditions set out in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do councillors have any questions for the officer? Councillor Tipple. I just looked at the um, previous one you put on there. That, um, they put one year time limit on that, but you've got two years on this. Is there any reason? I know you said it's reduced two years, but what would, it, what would the time limit normally be? Yeah, that's fine. So uh, in terms of the reason behind the one year and two year, etc. so because the application was approved, because we didn't have that five-year land supply, following in line of a recent appeal decision, we reduced that time limit for the uh, details of the reserve matters to be submitted within a year, and then for them to be built out within those two years following the last reserve matters approval. Hence why we've then brought that forward across into this application so they can be brought forward within those two years. Councillor Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, uh, one point of clarification. You say that there is already work being undertaken. Which plot is that on? Is that on number four? Yeah, yeah. that's plot number four. That's the one that's outlined in grey on the site plan. Councillor Vincent. Thank you. I, 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 all I was going to say is that you've answered my questions. My concern was, was the original um, approval, um, was the self-build a material planning reason as part of that approval, but I've heard that you say it wasn't. No, thank you. Could we any more questions for the planning officer? No. So we move now on to public speaking. We have Mr. Jason Parker registered to speak. Thank you. You have five minutes to speak from when you begin and we will give you notice when you have one minute left. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm Jason Parker of Parker Planning Services, the agent for this scheme. And w when this was originally approved for the four self-build plots, that the plan was to sell those plots and find self-builders that want them. And we thought there'd be a massive demand for that. Um, what happened is plot one, we had an offer on, that fell through. Plot four eventually sold. And it's sold to a gentleman who, who owns a lovely house building company and wants to live in the village with his family. The and he's been commissioned to deliver the infrastructure as well. 
uh, we carried on marketing plots one to three for a whole year, um, and it's now got to the point where he's nearly finished at plot four. He has turned around and said, well, actually, I'd love to build out the other three, but technically he currently can't because they're restricted to self-build. So what this permission would allow is for him to actually finish this development in a lovely way here, just continue it. Um, and a very lovely small house builder, they will actually offer people options on the house as well. So there's an element of customization available to those that are going to buy these buildings. Um, but you would have an easy development. The only real change is the way in which these properties will be financed. With self-build, they typically have to buy the plots, have to get finance, have to get a builder in. This way, he will buy the land, he will build it, and then he will sell the homes to people. Um, the other change, which is actually a benefit, is he has to pay seal. Self-build plots are exempt from seal, so there's about £60,000 payment going to come to the council that they otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, it was a lovely presentation, very clear, so thank you very much for that. Um, and everything else is all approved, all the design, everything is approved. He really wants to crack on with these plots, so please do approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do councillors have any questions for the speaker? Councillor Vincent. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. It's just a clarification on one of the letter of objection where um, an individual has on page 37, 411, said that they made what they consider a substantial offer for self build for that property. If you could answer that, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Um, I did provide some information to the planning officer. We discussed that. Um, I've actually been helping the landowners um, in terms of arranging the marketing um, and these next steps as well. So I've been fully involved with the sale process as well. So any offers and questions came to me through the estate agent. The only thing I can recall is that there was a phone call that came through the estate agent and they had some questions and they came to me and I discussed it with them. And it was some kind of group of people, they called themselves a consortium, that wanted to buy all four plots and additional land behind them and their offer was somewhere in the range of kind of half of the price of what the plots were marketed for. And, and also at that time, we had sold plot four and plot one. So there were no further discussions. There was no formal offering writing put forward. It never evolved really beyond that discussion. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for the speaker? No? Well, thank you very much for coming to speak today at the meeting. We now move into committee session and out of public speaking session. So I hand over to the committee for comments, discussion and voting. Would anyone like to begin? Councillor Wymark. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think it's been very clear that there's no material change here to the planning that was previously given. So I'd be very happy to uh, propose the, uh, the approval with conditions. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a proposal to approve this application from Councillor Weinmark, and that has been seconded by Councillor Baby. Do we have any comments from councillors or additions to the discussion? Councillor Vincent. Uh, just to say that the concerns that I had regarding that have been satisfied with the presentation that's been given and the answer that's been given by the agent, so I'd be happy to support. Thank you. Any more comments before we go to the vote? So we are voting to pro on the proposal that we approve this application all those in favour, raise your hands. That's unanimous, Chair. That application has now been approved.
We now move to item four on our agenda. That's planning application number 2023 slash 3758 slash F. This application is in Helsden on the site of the Broadland Snooker Centre on Reefham Road. And we have two planning officers at the top table to introduce this application. We have Sarah Everard, the area team manager, and Andrew Parnell, senior planning officer. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is a proposal for the change of use of the snooker hall at Reefham Road um, in Helston into a Class E retail space. So in terms of the location of the snooker hall, it's at the junction of, the, of Reefham Road and Middleton's Lane um, in Helston. So just to give you a little bit of a wider site context, um, we've got the snooker hall, which you can just see just here. Um, we do have a co-op um, shop um, just to the uh, northwest of the site. Um, on this roundabout itself, we've got, um, on this side, we've got um, a public house. And we've also got a little parade of other retail shops um, on this side of the road here, and then other residential property surrounding it. So this is um, a very residential re residential setting in the heart of Helston. Um, Middleton's Lane connects um, Drayton High Road up to the A140. Um, within this area, obviously, as you can see on this plan, there are a number of bus stops um, in the local area. It's a very sustainable location with also with good public transport links and also good pedestrian links with good foot paths and things all around the site. So. Um, Helston does have a neighbourhood plan and this site is covered within the neighbourhood plan and that is um, the, it designates the area as two neighbourhoods as part of a neighbourhood centre which is defined under policy five of the neighbourhood plan. Um, so this policy seeks to use these areas for commercial and retail space. Um, the key however is it um, tries to support vit the vitality, viability and diversity of these centres. Um, in terms of this application itself, um, we have had a previous application for the change of use of the snooker hall into um, commercial retail space. That was granted in December 2022. Um, as part of that application, it, it divided the space into three retail units. This application is just to change into just a single retail unit. The actual level of retail space itself is slightly lower than what was under those three units. But uh, so actually. And that is an extant planning permission. So the change of use in terms of allowing that to go into commercial retail, that can already happen under that extant approval. So in terms of the designs and the changes itself, um, the actual building itself is going to remain the same, um, but with ch changes to the windows and door detailing and also into the um, materials. So they're adding in some cladding and some render. And um, when we get to the photos, you can see, you'll be able to see if the building is... Um, slightly tired looking at the moment and it, and it is in quite a prominent location so I think actually these um, changes will be an improvement to the building. Just to sort of talk you around the building it's because it sits on that corner plot so you've got almost this um, end elevation which is existing and you can see the like I said very limited changes this is facing onto Reefham, onto Reefham Road this centre bit is almost facing directly at the roundabout and then this section is onto Middleton's Lane so it's sort of slightly curved to it which doesn't quite come across in that flat 2D plan. So and again, these are the um, existing. We've got the existing elevations on this side and the proposed elevations um, here. So, so sorry, I think we've got existing is um, yeah. So yeah, existing and then proposed change. So like I said, there's limited changes to those elevations and details there. And again, this is just taking from that other angle. So you can see in the main sort of the actual buildings, there's limited changes to how it's going to look, but just improvements to that material, those materials. Um, in terms of the floor space and the parking area, so the parking will be formalised. There'll be two accesses available, one from Reefham Road and one at, from Middleton's Lane. At the moment, the parking on, on site isn't formalised at all. There's no designated spaces. Um, so this um, application will actually mark out the parking spaces available, which will probably actually help the parking situation in, in 
um, serving that unit rather than having slightly inappropriate spaces where people aren't quite sure where the spaces are it actually almost formalizes it and I think that improves the situation it will also be providing an EV charging point as well and I think key here is um, the highways authority have been consulted and they haven't raised any objections to this scheme and they're happy with the proposal so just to take you around some photographs of the site so um, Obviously, we've got the, the unit here, and then you can see some of these other shops in the immediate vicinity of the site. And again, this is just the sort of the site frontage, and and then you can see it's sort of it's, it's slightly tired at the moment. It's probably how I'd best describe it. Um, so I think like the changes to the sort of the window detailing, the door detailing, adding a bit of cladding and um, render here, I think will actually improve that appearance. On actually a very prominent roundabout in Helston. And again, just slightly further, and you can get that sort of curved look of that's what the site looks like at the moment. And again, you can see that informal parking area on those, which will then be formalised as part of this application. And again, this is just sort of the round the back view. And then we've got a residential properties which start um, here. Again, yeah, just taking it around just so you can see it from a few different angles. And you can see some of the other residential properties on the other side of Middleton Plain. So um, overall, the change of use of the building into um, Class E is considered to be acceptable. Obviously, we do have that extant planning permission that has already allowed that change into, into retail units. Um, in terms of the amendments to the design of the building, I think um, actually what we're looking at is probably improvements to the building. They're not going to be radical changes, but I think it's going to actually bring it back into a, um, an improve, a pr improved appearance. In relation to the impact upon amenity, we've consulted with our environmental quality team and they've confirmed that then they don't object to the proposal. And we do have conditions um, relating to opening hours, acoustic um, different insulation around the plant material going onto the site and delivery times. And that's all about trying to ensure that there's no adverse impact on neighbours and that the environmental quality team are happy with that. Um, as I set out, the Highways Authority have also been consulted and they don't object to the proposal either. So overall, the proposal is recommended to you for approval. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do councillors have any questions for the planning officer? Councillor Orber. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you just explain to me a little bit about, it says at the front there, it says commercial. Is, is, that, is that all part of the same business that I'm assuming? Yes, it is. So it's looking at sort of um, the, these spaces are all related directly to that retail unit. So it's coming forward as a single use. Um, so that's just the access to that commercial space. And then it's got offices and things associated with it. Councillor Vincent. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. It, it, it's just around about the possible uses of the building. I'm, I'm reading the concerns raised by the local councillor and it's no indication within the report that we know what that potential use is going to be. That was one question and the other was around limited hours for deliveries. If you're able to give a bit more detail on that condition would be really helpful. Thank you. Yes, of course. No, so we, we don't have, um, we don't know exactly what retail unit wants to go in here. So I think it's looking at, is that acceptable? Um, to have that, have have this as a retail use, and I think in this instance it is, but we don't have the end user confirmed. So that does allow, in some instances, some flexibility about who could go in here potentially. Um, in terms of the uh, restrictions on um, deliveries, I think these are predominantly um, around um, HGVs, um, restricting those so that they're not happening in. Um, unsociable sort of later in night early hours of the morning it's restricting those sorts of deliveries reflecting the fact that there is residential properties nearby and you don't necessarily want those movements happening at like sort of 3 a.m type times um so it's, it's just restricting that and i can't quite think of the exact time to put in no i don't have an input on to me unfortunately but, but that did come from our environmental quality team it's just about trying to ensure that obviously the development doesn't have that adverse impact on, on the surrounding neighbors Yes, Councillor Vincent. If I could just come back on that. To, to what extent would the um, immediate residents be consulted on those delivery times? It's just to make sure that they're aware of them and able to comment and in influence those. Is that possible? Or has that been done? So, I mean, the, the condition has come about through our environmental quality team and, and their, and their 
Um, it, normally it's sort of, sort of restricted sort of after sort of ten sort of ten or eleven p.m. We don't normally consult on the precise wording of the conditions. Obviously, that comes about as part of that consultation process. But um, all of the neighbours have been consulted, so they will have been able to see all that information, which is all in the public um, domain. And sort of those environmental quality team comments come back at the same um, time, so that would have all been available to them. If you just give me one minute, I'll find the time sort of proposed. I've got them coming up, but carry on the discussion and I'll come back if that's okay. Yes, um, I have a question. I again noted the comments from the district councillor who would prefer to see three smaller units rather than one, and there is provision for this until December 2025. My question is, is it in the realm, within the realm of the planning department to insist that the building has to have three separate units? Could they potentially do that? So, um, both, so that scheme is still a live planning application, so if the applicants wanted to, they could still deliver that scheme. This scheme doesn't prevent that scheme coming forward as such. Obviously, if they you know, if they do build this scheme out, that sort of lapses that permission to some extent, to that extent. I think the key consideration here is, is this use acceptable? Is it acceptable for it to be one unit? I mean, I think the retail floor space area is not, it's not huge. It's about 280 square metres. And I think what we're looking at is, is do we consider that to be acceptable, bearing in mind that we think the use of that building is as retail is acceptable. It would probably be... Um, unreasonable of us to require it to be into three separate units. I think what we do have on the, as part of, I did read um, Councillor Gurney's comments, is obviously there are other retail units within the vicinity. You know, there is, say, the parade of shops opposite, which do provide that slightly smaller, different format of um, retail spaces available. So, if I, if I could just add as well, Chair, if that's okay. I think we might be in danger slightly of limiting the commercial viability of the scheme if we were to do that. Um, clearly, the applicant has already got permission in place for three units. I, I'm just presupposing, but they mustn't have the interest in that at the moment, so they're just giving themselves the option for a, a larger unit, were that to be the case. And if I can come back to Councillor Vincent as well on, on the hours, what's been proposed by the EHO, sorry, the Environmental Health Officer, is that, and um, read the condition exactly, the premises shall not be open to customers other than between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Monday to Saturday and 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. Sunday bank holidays and public holidays. And then for deliveries, the premises shall not be open to customers other than between the hours of 7 and 10. What they mean by that, the wording of the condition is actually not quite right. That should be the hours of delivery. It should be the deliveries shall not be available other than the hours of between 7 in the morning and 10 p.m. Thank you. Councillor Baby. Thank you, Chair. Just for a clarification, do they have any allocated parking for that uh, building? Any allocated parking? Because what I understand is they're all, the co-op and the corner shop, they're all sharing that area. So do they have any allocated uh, parking for uh, that plot? Um, yes, yeah, so you're, you're correct. At the moment, it's all um, shared parking and it's not, um, it's probably shared almost quite well on this side. It's, it's not demarcated um, at all. Um, in terms of this building itself, um, the parking spaces here and a couple of parking spaces here, these are within the direct ownership of this applicant site. Um, as part of a planning application, you can apply for planning permission on land outside of your ownership, subject to serving the correct certificates, which has all happened in this case. So this area of parking is, is shared with some of the other units as well. But I think um, key here is obviously, at the moment, it's very informal. And beyond that, there's additional parking, as you can see in front of the co-op and the premier um, shop as well. That also provides additional for that whole wider district centre. Um, so I think this will formalise that park that parking arrangement. And hopefully, you know, I think we've potentially got some interesting parking situations that might be happening on um, on that unit at the moment. And I think actually probably by formalising it through an application such as this, which, and demarcating those spaces, that will probably improve that situation. Um, but yes, there is an element of shared as well. 
Councillor Johnson. Uh, where would the HGVs be unloading on that site? Because the co-op delivered right down the back, the existing one. Where would the actual HGVs so. be downloading on that one? So I think um, the HGVs would be um, in, within this uh, area, any um, here. We've got um, sort of store and we've got um, access in um, in this side as, as well. Um, so that would provide access in to there and sort of via this space as well. And that, that's, you probably can't read it because it's very tiny, faint and writing on the slide, but it, that, that sets out to keep clear to provide access into the into the units. Councillor Tipple. Sort of follow on to that. So is that marked area, the keep clear area, the unloading space big enough for the vehicles they will be using for deliveries? Because yes, I'm concerned it will take up parking spaces for people to be using it. Yeah. Um, so I think it um, I think there would be space there in terms of getting in. I think I think probably key in terms of the types and st of delivery that's likely to be happening for this size of unit. I think that the retail element is 280 square meters. It's not we're not talking a big sort of supermarket type of unit here. here. So the deliveries aren't going to be in such you know I think is going to be accepted. And I think the key is also that the highways authority have reviewed all of these parts of the proposal and they are happy with it. If I can just come in as well, please, Chair. I think it's important to note that we have an existing use there already, and, and that use could have deliveries of, of all sorts. You know, it was the Broad and Snooker Centre before. It could have deliveries of um, alcohol, which are on HCVs anyway. What we give ourselves with this scheme is an ability to perhaps give a bit more control as to where those areas would be. I'm not saying this happens at the moment, but potentially that front area that we have could be used for the HGVs, they could be parked along the, the road. I don't know I don't know the area at those times of day well enough, but I think this gives us the control that would be beneficial. Do we have any more questions for the officer? We have no that he registered to for the public speaking session. So we now move into committee session for comments, discussion and voting. Would anyone like to begin? Councillor Tipple. Yeah, I, I agree what this isn't a direct plan set in terms of encouraging, you know, using this what's an empty unit within it and turn it to retail. I suppose my only concern about knowing what's going to go there, looking at the current convenience type stores directly opposite in terms of by allowing a larger unit, we could inadvertently cause other units on the site, such as others, to be, you know, out competed and got rid of. So I think it would have been nice to have three smaller ones, but I think given the fact that the applicant has come forward and wants to make it bigger. It's pretty obvious they couldn't find the interest to fill those units otherwise they wouldn't have um, come there. So I think the comment I made about the parking for the HGV is just that I've seen other developments where HGVs park on the parking for customers of the site. And I think it's important to have demarcation at those points because otherwise you get customers who are popping in for something who are parking in inappropriate places and causing a nuisance to the highway without that provision in place. Councillor Baby. Thank you. Yes, um, I too recognise the concerns about parking, but it would be difficult to turn down this application for 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 for, for that reason. Not, Cow Highways have got no concerns about parking, and there is other parking in the vicinity. And we're supposed to be moving away generally from car travel, certainly in terms of discussing about how customers are going to get 
to the site and that we're supposed to be developing the economy in a sustainable way. I mean, it's, it's quite good to see there is good access for pedestrians, cyclists, and there are bus stops near the site. So hopefully that will encourage customers to um, get to the shop in, in a range of, of ways. And at least as well, the parking spaces will be clearly demarcated on the site, whereas currently they aren't. So um, thank you for your proposal to approve this application. I'd like to second that. You'd like to second? Yep, go ahead. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll have Councillor Mia seconding the proposal. Thank you. So we have a proposer and a seconder to approve this application. Before we go to the vote, do we have any other comments? So if you're in favour of approving this application, please raise your hands. Is unanimous, Chair. Thank you. So that application has been approved. Before we move on to the final application, can I just ask, does anyone need a break at all, or are you happy to move on to the final one? Happy to move on. Great. Thank you. So we now move to application number, item number five on our agenda. The planning application number is 2023 slash 3877 slash H. It is in Sproston on number seven, Elizabeth Close. And it, the information is on page 70 in your agendas. To introduce this application, we have area team manager, Sarah Everard, and graduate planning officer, Jack Bessie, now at that top table. Thank you. Thank you. So this proposal is for a single storey rear extension to the existing dwelling and rendering of the property. Um, so the dwelling is a detached um, bungalow located on Elizabeth Close. You can just see it here on the application, um, on the site location plan. It's on a corner um, plot within sort of quite a reasonable size um, plot. So um, just to sort of zoom out, so a little bit um, further so you can sort of see this, um, the dwelling and the existing garage which is located um, in this corner here. Um, the rear extension is going to go into this location um, here. And again, just a little bit further out. So you can just see, obviously, it's a very residential part of Sprouston that we're looking at. So in terms of the existing elevations, it's um, a relatively uh, modest bungalow with, um, hip, with a hip roof. And you can see the detached um, garage, which is sort of set back from the front of the site. In terms of the proposed elevations, um, the scheme when it was originally submitted um, was for a much um, more significant scheme than what we, we're looking at now. So the original um, scheme that came forward uh, included raising the roof of the bungalow and also adding dormers to the front and back as, alongside that um, rear extension. Now, through ne so we did get a number of objections at this stage and through negotiations of the scheme, those that raise the roof is now going to be the same. There's no changes to the roof space. Um, there's no obviously, obviously you can see there's no dormers, and we're just looking at that rear extension. So those other elements they've been negotiated out of this scheme. Um, so as you can see, obviously we've got um, a flat roof um, extension going on here. It doesn't quite. So the whole property will be rendered. Um, it would just the garage was detached, and that would just become um, joined on. Um, there. The actual rear extension, again, it's, you can't, it's a bit hard to see here, but it doesn't quite go as far back as the garage. So the garage line finishes here um, and the rear extension is here. And that's extending out by approximately four metres from the rear, um, the existing rear wall of the, of the bungalow. And the um, overall height of that um, is 2.9 metres. In terms of what's being proposed within it, so this is um, would be providing an open plan kitchen diner lounge um, arrangement for the property. 
obviously you can see it is um, joining onto the garage, but the garage is being left as a, as a garage. That's not being proposed to be converted at this time. So in terms of the property itself, um, this is the existing front elevation. You can just see that how that garage is set back there. Um, again, the real change we're looking at for this front elevation is the introduction of render here. Um, but the sort of the parking arrangements and the, and the front garden things that will all remain as existing. And then just um, swinging around to the back, um, so the it, extension will come out across the full width of the property and sort of come out, but not quite as far back as that um, as that garage goes. There. And again, this is then just um, looking around the gardens, so you can see the other properties at the moment. And again, so then you can see these, uh, I think this is um, Foxborough Road here. So, and then this is the remainder of the garden. So um, in terms of the garden area, it will still have a reasonable level of amenity space um, as a real private garden, with it, even with this extension. So in terms of the introduction of render, because it's a brick property at the moment, the render, um, changing it to render does need planning permission, and it's why it's included on this application. Um, within the immediate vicinity, there are other examples of rendered properties and also properties that are painted as well. So I think um, we've just given you a little bit of a street scene to see some of those. So we've got render here. I think this one is actually painted and we've got other examples of render in, in the vicinity here. So um, we are of the view that the introduction of render to the property, which I think is going to be an off-white colour, that's not going to be out, out of character with the surrounding street scene, bearing in mind those other examples. And then I think just in terms of the um, extension itself and the putting that flat roof on, um, there are other examples, I'm just taking a couple of photos, where very similar things have happened in, this is along Elizabeth Close, and they've been built, so you can just give you a bit of a, of a flavour of actually you can, you know, that they have been built. They'll, from Elizabeth Close itself, there will be very limited views at all of, of this rear extension, but just there are other examples within the immediate vicinity. And again, I think here's another example. So overall, um, consider that the, um, the, rear, the single story rear extension is considered to be acceptable in terms of the design and scale, scale of the proposals. We do not consider it's going to have an adverse impact on neighbouring amenity and we recommend it to you for approval. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do committee members have any questions for the officer? Councillor Wymark. Thank you. Just, just to be clear, so, so the front elevation essentially will not change. So from the road, you won't actually see any real difference. That's the way it looks. Thank you. Um, it will be very, very limited. So I think obviously there's a slight increase in the height of the garage here, and that will be joined slightly. And I think the key change really is it's going to be rendered. So that will be the main difference that you'll see. But I think you'll see very limited of that um, rear innovation and, and the actual previous elements of the scheme, which have all been removed in terms of the dormer on the front and things. That's, that's all gone. So I don't think there'll be any other changes that you'll see from the street scene. So, so, so as you said before, though, the render won't be out of character with other properties nearby. No, and I think that's um, one of the key things we always look at is what's happening in the street scene. Are there other examples? And I think in this instance, there are quite a few other examples of either painted properties or properties that have already been rendered. You know, so I think it's not going to be out of character. Councillor Vincent. Thank you. I just wanted some clarification, if I may, about um, some of the comments raised within the report. Uh, well, one of them is on page 73 about insufficient on-site parking. Are you able to give any further details about parking arrangements for the proposal, please? Um, so the parking arrangements haven't changed. I think, um, if I just scroll back, you can see there is a reasonable sized drive here on the property. Um, this isn't proposing an increase in the number of bedrooms or anything at all. Um, that driveway is still all being proposed to be um, retained as is. So I think there is going to be still be sufficient parking for the property. It will be worth just, if you can, Sarah, just show us the third slide with the aerial view. 
where you can just point to the parking on there. You can see it's quite a long driveway that they've got in. And as Sarah said as well, we've got the retention of the garage. And I think it's important to note as well that whilst the property size might be increasing, it doesn't change necessarily the number of people that live in the property. It's still a single household, so the parking, in our view, would be sufficient. Councillor Tipple. Yeah, I know you've just uh, put that diagram up there, but have you visited the site and seen how they are currently accessing their property? So um, Jack has been out and, and, and done the site visit. Him, him, him. Not, the, not, the wall, the, not the wall down and accessing their front driveway through public for a public verge that sits there. I think it's on the first on the that site application that sort of hexagonal area is at a public verge, and they've knocked their front drive out to get access. So what's quoted in the report in that there's adequate um, park and provisional on-site parking. Obviously, the current residents don't feel that because they don't feel they have to use a public verge to access their property. So I would tend to disagree with that information provided in the report that um, if the current residents don't see, see that access provision of that single driveway currently sufficient, I don't think we should also consider it sufficient either. I would just make a, a brief comment back of that. So I actually noticed questions for the officers, but I think it's worth mentioning. So we haven't had any objections from the Highways Authority and whilst we're not bound by everything they say, we do use them to very much guide the parking provision that we have on a development. So in that respect, we have to go with that. Take point, this point well made. When I, when I look at it for a household of that size, that to me would be sufficient parking as well that you would expect for a development of that size. So whether the can choose to do that, 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 that was their choice, but we are satisfied from a planning perspective there's sufficient parking there. Councillor Vincent. Thank you. Uh, my, my other point, to, just to clarify, is on uh, paragraph 4.1, and it was a Sproston Town Council consultation, the second one, um, where they're referring to, we're hearing now that there's not enough of floor, but it still says that there's stairs referred to on the plan. So just wanted to understand that, please. So on the original plans, uh, there were uh, comments made about stairs, which would be internal stairs leading up to the uh, second floor where the dormers were to be placed. And on the revised plans, they were not removed initially. However, on we've got now revised, revised plans, which have removed those comments. And so now everything does relate to the current plans, which are going to be uh, stuck to. Um, a, a similar point that I'd raised earlier in the mor morning, um, are, have permitted de development rights been removed to prevent that property being extended upwards? If not, could they be added? Um, so at the moment we haven't removed permitted development rights. So in terms of the reason why is because of what can actually happen under permitted development rights. So I think that's really important to consider. So under permitted development, you can't raise the height of the ridge of the roof. You can't raise that ridge height. Um, you can't put make really any amendments to the front elevation, so you can't put on a front dormer without planning permission. All of those elements need planning permission. You can put on a rear dormer without planning permission, so, but there are still restrictions on the size and the extent of floor space that you can add on without planning permission. So we haven't proposed to remove permitted development rights. I think when we look at it, we need to consider whether it's appropriate to remove permitted development rights or not from a property. And one of the key tests is it has to be necessary to make this development acceptable. I think in terms of this, we are looking at a single storey rear extension. So I think it would be hard to say that it was necessary to make the development acceptable to move, remove permitted development rights. Um, but I think to give you that comfort, which I, you know, I, I appreciate you probably want that comfort is, I think the existing permitted development rights do give restrictions give that comfort in that they can't raise raise that ridge height they, there's quite a lot of restrictions about what they can do and actually it does make it quite hard for a bungalow compared to actually almost what you can do with a with a two-story detached dwelling you know it's actually those restrictions are quite you know not being able to raise the roof it's only um you can't add a huge amount of cubic uh, volume to that to that roof space without planning permission um so i think that probably deals hopefully that covers that element of it and i think it's looking at those tests and whether it's 
reasonable and necessary to make this development as as now is put forward not not the scheme that originally came in which we we also had concerns about acceptable it's making this it has been necessary to make this scheme as before you acceptable councillor tiffle um a bit of, that's um particularly just a property yes it is so to i'm seeing it we're talking about a rear door but for, for lot of progression example in this i see they'd need to, if they were to go to um the gable route would they have to get plan permission for a gable route or that no it's it, that is permitted development i think it's um personal opinion one of the unfortunate parts of permitted development um you can go from a hip to a gable but i think the restriction is the, the over yeah. so they can't they can reach the height they also it's a restriction on the actual amount of volume you can add to the roof so i think it's um fifth just just kindly got printed it out for me <laughs> and it's fifth you can't go more than 50 cubic meters of volume increase to a roof space under permitted development so that does so you know if they want to go from hip to gable that's going to take up some of that volume space to then go out to a dormer a actually that does restrict it in quite a lot of ways okay. could i just add to that as well sorry um i won't mention my hip to gable dormer that uh, window that we got done last year but it, it's in the city so let's not worry about that the the is not the issue perhaps but it's worth noting that if we were to remove the limited development from this dwelling well there's nothing to stop all of the other dwellings in the street using their permitted development right so it would seem potentially unreasonable to be removing permitted development from on this this property just because they've put a planning application in we have no control over the other properties thank you councillor tip talk about permitted development that's obviously for um lock conversion or, or race what about what the position on in terms of the garage so if the garage was like part of the property in a, a modern term be they turn it into a bedroom and therefore change the number of bedrooms in the property. Is that something we can look at potentially? Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking. I think I'd go back to the, the question or, or the point that Sarah raised earlier on, really about the tests for the planning conditions and whether that would be fully reasonable or, or necessary in this instance. I would fall down on, on, on that not, but that's just the professional advice to, to the members. It, it's up to you to make that decision uh, in terms of what we have. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for the officer? No. So we now move into the public speaking session. I'd like to invite Karen Knight to come and speak, please. Thank you. And you have five minutes to speak from when you begin, and we'll give you notice when you've got one minute left. Um, I strongly object to the submitted planning proposal for Elizabeth Close. The two-bedroom property was only purchased in December 2023. It could possibly be an investment opportunity to make a quick profit and move on. It's situated in a cul-de-sac of 14 bungalows. It's visible from both Cousins Hardy and Foxborough roads. Although the other bungalows have extended, they still have back gardens, which back onto the other properties where this one won't. Um, my garden is really small and the garage is already the boundary of the garden. Um, and although I'm relieved they did remove the revised plans, the first floor. Um, I have lived on Foxborough Road for 20 years and my neighbours have been there considerably longer. There are a few <coughs> houses crammed into a small space and the gardens are very compact. The position of the property being discussed has a small back garden that is extremely close to my garden's boundary and house. My garden is very small and the existing garage is already imposing and dominates a lot of my garden. But the plans of here to show the roof even at the highest point, will be raised considerably and the width extended to meet up with the extension. The height of the new extension with additional protruding skylights is much taller than under eaves height at present. Being so close, it will block a lot of the natural daylight and it will be seen from my downstairs dining room, kitchen and garden. 
as the main living space of the extension is all open plan and in such close proximity to my boundary, I think it will have an impact on how I use and enjoy my garden. My garden is north facing, so any sun I do get is not all here around it. It's at the end of the garden and I rely on natural light. The extractor fan is very close, pointing straight into my garden, which is not ideal. And I did explain the reason to the planning officer, but I didn't want it publicly recorded. This is also another reason for the objection, because I spend a lot of hours in the kitchen looking out of the window in that direction. The plans show two 1800 millimetre windows placed above the fence, looking straight into the gardens of the houses 73, 71 and 69 Foxborough Road. If granted permission, can these be obscure grass? The proposed extension is not in line with the current look of surrounding buildings, which remain in traditional brick with white windows, not grey windows, white rendering and black fascias. The dominant feature was a garage which actually forms the boundary wall in my garden. The shed, which was placed there before I moved in. The plans will show, also show a fence behind and to the side of the garage but there is not a fence there at the moment. I also have reservations about the need for soundproofing and the function of the music room. Is it to be used for personal, commercial, band practice, or is it intended as another bedroom? The plan shows a considerable extension for the additional living area, but only two bedrooms, one being very small. I am concerned that the large empty room next to the kitchen which still has space where the stairs were shown in the original plan will be reinstated in a further future planning permission, but you've already addressed that and said that they can build upstairs. Parking, the front wall has been demolished and parking on the council green. Um, the, present per the person who has the um, bungalow has loads of work vans and cars. Um, the garage is being extended at the front, so the drive will be smaller. And they're also removing the bay at the front of the house and making it a flat wall. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the speaker? No? Well, thank you very much for coming to speak today at the committee. Thank you. We now invite Mr. Brian Herbison to come and speak. If I'm just here to make speeches. Ah. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Um, do we have any questions at all for Mr. Herbison? So he's not here to speak and give a presentation. But if you have any questions, he he is the agent for this application. So. Chairman, did you say he's, he's here or he's not here? Sorry, he is here in, in the row behind. He's Should he take up his position over here? Um, do, we, do we have any questions potentially for the agent? Yeah. Yes. Mr. Herbison, would you would you mind? Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Ah, right. right, thank you. Councillor Orber, I believe you have a question. I do. <clears throat> Can you uh, bring up the rear elevation of the bungalow? No, the, the plans, revised plans for it. There's a couple of windows, and it was mentioned uh, there by one of the residents that they could possibly overlook. Is, uh, 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 they're 1.6 above, well, they're certainly above the fence, which gives the impression that it could be overlooking. Um, from inside, are they going to be above uh, head height, those windows, or are they going to be physically going to be... Uh, uh They've been introduced purely just to let in as much natural daylight into the extension as possible, but they've also been positioned at high level to retain the neighbouring um, privacy of the neighbours. Sorry, it's not very clear on the 
it's not very clear on the plans, but is that a sort of roof light in the kitchen as well? Yes. On the, uh, over, the, over the kitchen island? Yes. Two lanterns. There's two lanterns proposed. Yep. There is quite a lot of light. For, from the lanterns, yes. Do we have any more questions for the speaker? Oh, Councillor Vincent. Um, thank you. It's just, are you able to respond to any of the concerns raised by the resident in, 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 in her presentation? One of the concerns of um, the lady that just spoke was the increase in the height of the garage. Um, this, this was introduced just for ease of construction. The objectors um, pointed out that our garden's north facing by introducing or increasing the existing garage height will not block any natural daylight from her because it's further north from her existing garden. So the increase in that is further away from the sun than our existing garden. So th there'll be no loss of existing sunlight. The, the, the other two concerns I heard was around the music room and the extractor fan. Is there anything or clarification you're able to provide on either of those? The, the extractor fan, if it's the one to the kitchen, is about three foot, 900 mil away from the fence. Um, me personally, I've got a neighbour's extractor tractor fan right up against my boundary. All new developments require extractor fans through building control. Um, and personally, from my neighbours, I've, I've never felt it as being intrusive. They're not noisy and they certainly don't. Yes, okay, they disperse smells, but it's not like living next to a chip shop or a fishmonger's where it's a, a constant um, odour. Um, but these are required by building the control. It's, it's not the client's choice. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? No, thank you. Thank you for coming up. So now we move out of public speaking session into committee where we will comment and discuss the, or discuss the application and then vote. Would anyone like to begin the discussion? Councillor Orber. Um, I consider this uh, extension for quite a reasonable request. They're filling in a little back bit of the garden. Um, it, it doesn't seem too uh, too large in relative in, in respect to the rest of the house. Um, I think the design seems to have taken into account what's already there in the neighbourhood and also what other people have already done in the neighbourhood as well. So I think I'd like to um, support the proposal and um, yeah, on 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 based on the existing plans. Thank you. So we do have a proposal that this application is approved from Councillor Orber. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Brennan, thank you. Um, would anyone like to make any more comments or discussion points? Councillor Tipple. Yeah, I personally disagree with Councillor Orber a bit there. I think in terms of look at the size of the back garden, you know, that's taken up a considerable amount of that back garden. You looked at the paved area and the pictures. Um, yeah, it's going all across the, the back of the property. I, I, feel, I feel when people do stuff like this, it's like they've um, found a property that's not quite big enough for their needs. They want to make it bigger. And I, I, I feel it's a little bit of overdevelopment in terms of just going too, too big. It's, it's not needed. I think how close in pro proximity, you know, I've had personal experience in this. Um, it's not pleasant when you, you know, you will... If you sit in your back garden, you enjoy that community of your back garden, you will then see this, you know, 
bigger it's, building, it's, which apparently you know, it's a lot closer to, to the to the boundary than the current bungalow. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, I think it's overdevelopment. And, yeah, I, I, and I'm not satisfied around the parking arrangements either. Um, so yeah. Councillor Baby. I like to support what um, Andrea said. Do you like to propose as an objection? Well, we we currently have a proposal that's been seconded, so we're now in discussion before we go to the vote on that. I mean, I'm asking proposal. whether he's going for uh, proposing an objection to this proposal as well. So the process will be we go with proposal that's on, on, the, second on, on the, the and then that, that loses, then we'll get to it. That second thing. Okay. Uh, Councillor Weimark. Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman. I've, I've not heard anything that's material in planning terms to oppose this. Whether we like it or not, someone can build out their garden in this regard. The, the extension is not really visible from the road. The, the render is not out of character. It's been done elsewhere. The, there's lots and lots of reasons why we, we absolutely should support this. And I, and I, I do support it. I, I see no reason to object to it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Vincent. Thank you. Um, I, I'm mindful of the concerns that we've heard raised today um, uh, and understand those. Where I'm struggling is where the planning reason would be to refuse. And that, that's my dilemma at the moment. Thank you. Um, and, and I agree with, with uh, what Councillor Vincent has, and Councillor Weimark have, have said, but I do have a couple of questions I just wanted to raise. Would, um, I think, a, a possibility of removing permitted development rights from the, from the garage was mentioned. Would that be reasonable? Uh, or it, it would certainly be possible to do. It would be possible to do. Okay. That's possibly what it's been, uh, my discussion is making, sorry, you weren't asking this question, so it's probably proper to answer it in this way, is that there's no indication that they're looking to do anything with that, that garage. We have the, the parking provision in there at the moment. But I suppose I'll, I'll just answer the question in, in a clear way. Yes, there's nothing to stop that from happening. Okay, thank you. And um, one of our speakers mentioned the possibility of having obscured glass in some of the windows that might overlook her property. Would that be possible and or reasonable? I think probably just to jump in ahead of Ben quickly. Um, so I think they're set at sort of 1.6 metres. I think what is key is we need to consider what boundary treatments they have permission that doesn't need planning permission. So on a rear boundary, a boundary treatment can be up to two metres in height without planning permission. And that's um, this property has that right to be able to put out the fence at the, at the rear of their garden to two metres in height. I think... Um, that in itself, I mean, normally properties can also put in within rear elevations. Uh, they can put in new new windows um, as part of their permitted development rights. So I think, um, whilst I understand exactly where the, when, and some where the neighbours coming from, I think those restrictions and those requirements around what actually can be done is that can you know if you have a fence up to two metres on the rear garden, that would prevent that overlooking happening. So would it be reasonable therefore to require those that. Uh, but uh, ground floor level to be obscure glazed. I, I think it might not be reasonable in that instance to have those as being obscure glazed. Thank you. Councillor Weimark. Thank you, Chairman. I know you, you brought up the, the question around permitted development and, and uh, withdrawing that, but obviously when we look at the, I suppose, the test about whether it's reasonable or not, would we do that for the, every other bungalow in that close? I would say probably not. So, so on, on that test, I'll put it as a test, <laughs> I would say it would be difficult to actually impose that as a condition. Mm. Personally, I think it would be very difficult. Thank you. Do, oh, sorry, Councillor Tipple. Yeah, I, I, back to development for the garage, I suppose. 
the garage does count as parking space. If you're from some, some of the stuff that's going to be a parking rather than plan application, that counts towards the parking needs for the property. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, what, about two or three cars probably on the, on the drive in front of it. I don't know what the, how many spaces are, but I think the fact that you're inc we're increasing the living space for it, I think they're adding that kitchen diner and big extension on the back. I think if you were allowed then to then convert that garage without, you know, come for plan permission um, and it's under permitted development rights, um, I think you then end up with a property um, where the parking allocation or parking allowance doesn't allow for that side of the property. But that's the only reason I'd, I'd probably want the permit development rights to move it, the permit development rights on the garage. I think, I think this is something I, I perhaps said before, but apologies if I didn't. We are still only, it's still only a single unit dwelling. We're not increasing it to two units. Therefore, in our view, in, in the county council's view, from a highways perspective, we're only operating on one unit. Uh, and I take the point in terms of, of increased bedroom size and such like, but there is sufficient parking there at the moment to cover what, what is in the this application on that individual unit that we have at the moment. So to go back to the point about moving permitted development rights, would that be reasonable? I don't feel as though it would pass the test. Do we have any more comments at all? And so we have a proposal on the table to approve this application with the proposer being Councillor Alba and the seconder being Councillor Brennan. We're now going to take a vote. So for those in favour, please raise your hands. And those against? Two against, Chair. And any abstentions? And one abstention, Chair. That's carried. Thank you. So that planning application has been approved. And that concludes our planning application approvals. We now go to page 77 of the agenda to look at planning appeals. Thank you, Chair. So Give me for what we would um, usually do in this instance if if we had any appeals that went against the decision that we made there were none in this instance the um, inspector went with the decisions that we made which take that as positive so there's nothing to report back on at this point thank you very much and so we now conclude this planning meeting thank you to everyone